I'm Leila Kohn, founding director of the Formative Psychology Center in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I have the good fortune to have known Stanley Kellerman since 1988 and studied personally with him for the last 30 years of his life. Over these years, we developed a close professional and personal relationship and conceived of filming interviews and conversations that would document his current practice and thinking and at the same time allow more people to experience and be inspired by his presence, his vision and his personal vitality. Our collaboration produced three one-hour interviews available on Vimeo and DVD. All Stanley's recorded materials are archived by the Formative Psychology Institute in Berkeley, California and overseen by Marilyn Heller. Together, Marilyn and I are continuing to use Stanley's conversations to create short films that illustrates his unique understanding and contribution to how each of us learns to participate in forming our life. Film topics cover fundamental concepts and the development and application of his formative work. In this film, conversation includes the organizing principle and how Stanley developed a language for speaking about the life of the body, a language unique to his formative approach and which no other discipline uses. While Stanley refined his methodology over time, his vision of the human being as a self-forming organism remains remarkably consistent. Just like his book, Emotional Anatomy, which has been in continual use all over the world since 1985, his concepts remain even more relevant for meeting the challenges of our world today. We hope you enjoyed the film. It is with great joy and great honor that I'm going to be doing these interviews with you, Stanley, who have deeply inspired me both in my professional and personal journey. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure for me in these 25 years to watch you grow and become who you are and to be equals in a world that didn't start that way. We formed something wonderful. Just reminds me of, I'm a father. I am a person who has grandchildren. I have formed a personal life beside a work life, just as we formed a professional life and a friendship that really extends to your family in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to be doing this with you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that have deeply impacted me in your work in these 25 years that I have known you is how solid it, how is it solidly based on biological foundation and how you are deeply rooted in evolutionary process. And the concept of the human being as an embodied formative process entails that vision, and this is your creation, your language. I'd like you to talk a little bit about the human being as a subjective embodied process. You know, being an intuitive person, in which, uh, in school, I mean, many times a teacher would say to me, you know, you get the right answers, but I have to give you less than a good mark because you don't say how you got there. And so in some way, they sort of uh, inhibited you from developing your intuition because you weren't a sort of a objective observer or a sort of lo logical symbolic thinker. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I never gave up my sense of intuition about understanding something and then finding ways to explain that, to look for language or to look for concepts. So that's a really important thing about trusting your way of functioning. So you have to see that in that sense, I found a way that reflected me and was brought rewards for me about that, oh, how I do something really is how thinking takes place. You know, it reminds me of running into Albert St. Georgie 
a two-time Nobel Prize winner. He was about 85 when I saw him in, uh, in California giving a small talk. And Albert St. George pointed out that he understood that a protein, animal acids, carried a, an electrical current. But nobody could prove it. They said, no, it doesn't. Animal, animal, acids, uh, animal acids do not carry a current. And he didn't agree with them. He said it took him 40 years to, to wait for the, the invention of the semiconductor, saying sometimes it conducts a mm -hmm. current and sometimes it doesn't. He said it took 40 years for a concept to show that he was right. Well, mm -hmm. I, it, that, unless I really heard that that lesson was for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you have intuitions and that you investigated. And in investigating your intuitions, you either get answers or you don't. But you're always confronted with the practicality of your efforts, even though you didn't have the explanations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I learned early, many times you write for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that came how I kept having trust in myself mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. time and forming. So I understood that how I behaved, how I used myself, had something to do with how I thought. So I mm -hmm. took on, well, okay, so the body is itself doing something that I don't know about, but it does it, like walking. Mm -hmm. So I remember learning how to analyze my walking behavior. You did that? I did that. Walking in the streets, I almost got uh -huh. killed doing it, but how I lifted my leg, how I breathe, what... Uh -huh. I mean, I spent a lot of time just understanding the process of how I walk, how I learned it. I'm remembering how my father walked. I didn't want to be like my father walking, mm -hmm. and how you walk like a man, and how you walk like yourself. Mm -hmm. And this became an enormous source of information for me. Mm -hmm. And I began to see the connection you know, and I remember waking up and saying, you know, F oh, I understand. Freud is seeing the symbolic image of what he thinks behavior is symbolically, but he doesn't see it rooted in the body as an event that the body is a way mm -hmm. of using itself as a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there I was. So and when I ran into Nina Bull, mm -hmm. she said, the body is an action-oriented organism, and everything is based on its action pattern. And she taught me the anatomical, neurological, and physiological facts that told me how right I was mm -hmm. in my perceptions of what it, the body is and how it is lived. Mm -hmm. And that grew into what an embodied life is. Mm -hmm, and that then mm -hmm. grows into the body and the body and its brain and the brain and the body. And then that grows into what's the language of body experience? Well, this is my next question, because you have not only created a new way of thinking about the body and working with the body, but, but a whole new language, an embodied language. And I wanted to ask you, how was that process? And how is that process? Because you're still doing it. Well, you know, how do you try to explain to another person how you did something in which you began to use anatomical, physiological language and symbols and mechanical images, and you realize you are not really saying what experiences? And the more that I entered into the world of how do people talk about the body in literature, in mythology, in novels, you see that they hinted at it. They made hints of how we stand slumped over, but they didn't know how to talk about it. And that I realized, wait a second, there is no language for the embodied life. There's a language for the symbolic life. There's mm -hmm. a language for the imaginative life. Mm -hmm. There's a, a language for the mechanical life. But there is no language for an embodied life. How is that possible? 
And then I saw that was my task. And so then I answered the question. I, yeah, the question was really answered for me in Germany in 1965. There is no language. Where the hell do you start? How do you start with a language? And I said, well, the language must start with how the body grows itself. The language must start with what is the organization that takes place in the womb and brings you into the world in some way in which the logic of organization is present. And then I understood, yes, you have to look at the body, the body plan, how the body puts mm -hmm. itself together, what could be the experiences, how do you talk about it, how do people think about how they feel something and then act on something. And then I began to search the language and I came first to the relationship between excitement and action and mm -hmm. saw that <clears throat> people talk about energy, mm -hmm. they were not talking about work. Energy is work, so let's talk about how the organism works, because that's the mm -hmm. expression of energy very directly. Mm -hmm. And I began to say to people, tell me when I ask you to do something, how you do it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. nobody could answer. Mm -hmm. And then we started to talk about it. And then the exercises that I developed, that, so when I came back, uh, I mean, then I had, I, uh, I teamed up with a dancer, we were looking at the clinical uh, ways that schizoid people or manic depressive people move and try to understand their movement patterns and how they talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I began then to find, if I asked them to do in, uh, very specific movements, show me how you make anger movements, show me how you make uh, determination movements, show me how you organize that. And I, I, to see the organizing mm -hmm. process, although people didn't talk about it. And then I began to make the language, and then I saw a language starts with understanding something about the context of the language, and then it has to develop. It's not ready-made. Mm -hmm. And I was in the yes. business. Uh, okay, I understand. Mm -hmm. I have to help it develop. Mm -hmm. And from mm -hmm. that came the organizing process, how the body plan comes in stages, what are the stages of its development, and then I thought it must be the same in how you learn. There must be an underform stage and a form stage, and how you get from something that's a shadow of form and sophistication, and you can't use the word, it happens, muscle grows, neural connections grow. Yeah, that's true, but if that doesn't tell you the experience, of how somebody feels about feeling unsure and underformed, and they don't quite know what to do with it. Now they criticize that state in themselves, so they don't know, and they don't see it as a learning state. Mm -hmm. So just taking on that, so you would say then that the subjective experience is grounded on somatic experience. It completely. A, this is, it's a continuum. It is, this is where it's grounded. There yes. is no doubt in my mind about that action precedes thought. And Albert St. Georgie says it very clearly in his book called Bioenergetics, which is the molecular foundation uh, of muscle and so, uh, action. He said, muscle is the fuel of thought. But I knew that long before that was said. So you see how a person is organizing an action involuntarily and voluntarily is in fact a thinking process, whether it's thinking in terms of feeling, thinking in terms of images, thinking in terms of holding an image still, thinking in terms of feeling your way into a feeling, seeing the relationship between I am depressed and raising my chest and the depression feels better. But that's already a relationship, the person with herself. Right, and then I realized, we assume people know how to do something. Yes. It's untrue. 
Mm-hmm. They know how to breathe, but they don't know how to walk. They have mm-hmm. to be taught to walk. People don't realize that was the big insight for me. Nobody walks without somebody giving them a hand. Mm-hmm. Nobody walks without the child in some way seeing other people walk. And they'll learn motorically. Mm-hmm. And that they stumble and they shake and they don't know how to do this. And they keep using themselves, making corrections, making connections inside with corrections. And then they are learning from an unformed state, learning balance that is making connections, gaining strength. And they live through this. Mm-hmm. And then they are walkers. And then they don't apply those lessons or are able to access those lessons. If you ask them how they deal with anger, how they deal with high excitatory states, how they deal with relationships, and then you realize, wait a minute, they forget about the interaction. They think that if you tell them how they're behaving and how they should correct it, that they know how to do this. They don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. They have to make some attempt at it. The body and the brain will do something, but it doesn't mean it's right. Mm -hmm. So, because with the walking uh, example, we are touching on the inherited body and the formed body. Everybody is born um, pre-programmed to be able to walk. They're born with the program to walk. With the program to walk. But all the evidence is that you're not in a walking community. You don't stand up straight. Exactly. So you form (coughs) your way of walking in the world, influenced by the people You form the walking possibility. Yes. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. Right? Yes. 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 It's learned. 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 Just as turning over... Uh-huh. You turn over the child, you watch the child in the crib, it turns over. Uh-huh. And then you see it tries to do it deliberately. Uh-huh. And then it tries to manage turning over. You uh-huh. see it's practicing doing something. Uh-huh. And then you realize, what are the imagined states? Is the child feeling what he's doing? Is the child imaging what he's doing? What is the experience of that? So then you say to somebody, Stand next to a bed, now fall down, fall on the bed. What is it like to feel the experience of falling? You know you're not going to get hurt. They all think people feel anxious. And then I say, don't get up quickly. Try and get up slowly as if you want to learn to put yourself on your feet. And then you see the world of experience opens up for you. And for the person, they really begin to understand. And now I mean understand experientially. Understand by muscle action and all the consequences of muscle action, which is feeling, image, and thought as a rehearsal for action or differentiating reaction. Mm -hmm. That they are basing it on these perceptions, which are there but are ignored. So when, when the person slows down in action, then he gets all the experience of the action. He gets more sensory input. Yes. And he doesn't, uh, isn't proceeding at top speed mm-hmm. to get to the end result. Right. He's again experiencing how the end result came about. Okay. And where does awareness and consciousness come into this picture. Awareness, what? Awareness, awareness and consciousness come into this picture. Oh, this is a very complicated and simple question to answer. There is a sentence that the organism is born with, but this meaning a kind of a generalized awareness. I imagine this. Mm-hmm. It cannot develop from, a, you would have to say, the explosion inside the egg, actually it's an implosion, an implosion that has certain uh, phases, and that, that in, comes, you get a ball that's a solid, that's a, a, that from a solid ball you develop a sphere, from a sphere you develop a plate, a plate folds in on itself and it develops a tube, the tube folds in on itself and develops an organism where things grow inside it, meaning organs from different places in the tube, 
And then there's got to be some sort of generalized sensorial or chemical, some knowing of some sort in this organizing process. And so when you recognize like a child is born, I often thought that's the first organizing principle of voluntary effort. Even though it's a reflex, they are turning themselves and pushing against the uterine contractions to support their own motoric connection, connections mm -hmm. and overcoming resistance. And in doing this, they're preparing themselves to make a transition from interuterine breathing to air breathing. And then you recognize that there is a kind of sensorial, I would say motoric sensorial awareness. There is an action-oriented program of either making the tube, folding the tube, even though it's involuntary. There is some sensorial chemical knowing of this event. Very early. Yes. Very early. And then breathing air, because you see what happens if you don't breathe air, they get uh -huh. death blue. And then you see there is a generalized motoric awakening of mm -hmm. first the sphincters after birth, like the mouth and mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. early eye movements, although they don't even see yet. Their eyes are moving in relationship to the scent of smell and tactility of warmth and looking for a body to be placentally close, mm -hmm. and then how it turns and turns in order to look for the breast until it finds it and narrows its turning. And you realize that this is these actions are the building up of awareness. That I see that action builds awareness. And when you work clinically with people, mm -hmm. so when I develop voluntary muscular effort, when I ask somebody to do something voluntarily, you see them building up an awareness of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And if you ask them to be aware of something, you see that they're trying to capture something rather than let something form by going the other way. Mm -hmm. So that you see there's a relationship between action and mm -hmm. sensorial, sensorial awareness. Mm -hmm. Then you see it waking up. Then you mm -hmm. see that connection and then you can work with that. And then the person starts a relationship with herself. Right. So right? then you see that the organism, you then extrapolate, holy smokes. The organism knows something about organizing itself. And I want to know your organizing experience. And then you come to see that there's the possibility of the organism being able to form differentiate its experience. Mm -hmm. And I, when I understood like the body plan, when you see some inherited intelligence of being able to remember in a genetic way acts of organizing complex organisms, you are dealing then with what the ancients call soul, the organizing process that remembers how to organize mm -hmm. the life process, the life body, mm -hmm. so that you see that instead of when moving from soul to organizing process allows you not to be a sensorial symbolic interpreter or getting into the mist of um, what your feelings are and trying to expound the feeling. Mm -hmm. You're getting in, if you're using the word organizing, that there's a process, there's a series of steps mm -hmm. in this process, and you could put that to work. Mm -hmm. Like I did it with voluntary muscular yes. effort. You look at it, I mean, you know, one of the great things about um, uh, Ludwig von Beethoven, because he was deaf, right? he invented the system of very detailed notations about how he wanted the music played. So then he makes a language of music mm -hmm. as a physical act okay. that could be understood in a cortical symbolic way. Yes. And it's the same thing then to say that 
the organizing process, which becomes the form-making process, which I just gave you an example mm -hmm. of, is in fact what the ancients were calling soul and mm -hmm. spirit. Okay. And I recognize that, that this is an embodied event and that every single person, when they say they know themselves, they know how they function. They know how they wake up in the morning and how long it takes mm -hmm. them. They know how they make meaning for them. They know this. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That is it. Yeah.